Thank you, Mayor Osika. Um, so I have been asked to provide my comments and thoughts on a few aspects of procurement, um, sort of what is procurement, a bit of a kind of tour de force overview of the rules of procurement, um, uh, a little bit about claims and lawsuits and how you get into trouble, and then how you avoid the trouble of the lawsuits. Uh, so that's what I will cover. Let me start with just a story that I've been working through with a client over the last uh, two or three weeks. I have a client whose public sector body, they had a uh, construction competition where a project was fully designed and they put it out to tender. Uh, the tenders were all due, fixed price tenders, due on Thursday at 2 p.m. The tenders come in. They had a slight complexity with a follow-up submission date uh, Friday, the day after, where they were looking for some supplemental information as part of the tender process, and they got that you know, supplemental information. But they got a surprise in the supplemental information on, on Friday. They got an amendment reducing the bid price from one of the bids on the Thursday. And it was an interesting price amendment and attractive, and they evaluated, and somewhere, somewhere along the line, one of the people on the evaluation team said, well, let's phone John. And so they phoned John, and it caused me to think a little while. And, and so I'll tell you a little later on in the process or in today's presentation what I thought about that. Um, but this attractive bid or amendment to a bid that made the price on Thursday seem more attractive on Friday because it improved the price, and the issue is, ought they to take it into account? Um, and knowing the answer requires you to kind of have read some of the sections in, thank you, uh, municipal procurement, all 1,100 pages of it, so there's a bit of complexity to the answer, and I'll loop back to it in due course. Um, so what is procurement? Uh, quite simply, it's the art of buying stuff, and you know uh, that better than I do. Your organizations buy lots of stuff. Um, so if that's all there was to it, you wouldn't need me and you wouldn't need the book. Um, so there's complying with the process expectations of buying stuff. You're in the public sector. Uh, and you're expected to buy stuff uh, according to some principles of fairness and other uh, good public considerations. So there's, it's not only the art of buying stuff, it's buying it, complying with a good process. And then part of that process is effective decision making and how do you get these proposals, these bids, and then how do you evaluate them and make a good decision? So uh, in a nutshell, that is, you know, what you're doing in the world of procurement, you're buying stuff, you're following, designing good processes, and you're making good decisions. I, I used the analogy uh, previously, uh, it's like playing hockey. All of us can go out and play shinny, we can go play on the outdoor rink and have a good pickup game of hockey. We all know how to play hockey and have fun. The question is, do we all know, could we go out and play it in the SJHL or in the WHL? Do we know all the rules to play hockey in accordance with the rules. And so I think that's an analogy. You're, all your organizations are playing hockey, they are buying stuff. Are they doing it according to all these rules or the rules of the game? Um, that's what I'm here to talk a little bit about. But regardless of whether you know the rules, you're playing the game. So procurement is really a competition between two competing forces. Um, commercial objectives versus public process objectives. I was in High River, Alberta yesterday giving a half-day session on procurement. I had reason to talk to them about their procurement policy, and th their policy nailed the tension perfectly. The town of High River is committed to fair, equitable, and competitive procurement practices. Perfect. That should be in every one of your policy statements. And then, not surprisingly, it went on to say, and their purpose is also to minimize operational costs, duplication of effort, and procurement delays, meaning there's an internal efficiency component. You need stuff, you need it next week, you don't have all the time in the world, and you can't start every procurement by picking up this book and starting in chapter one and saying, what are the rules today? Problem was they had three bids, and two of them didn't make it past stage one. 
So now they've got a procurement process and there's only one horse in the race. Good public process is about competition. And if you design your process to weed out too much competition, I suspect you're not meeting some of your public policy objectives of getting good competition on price. Um, the court actually agreed. So the unsuccessful bidders challenged, or one of them challenged the process. The one bid that was left standing, the price was $11 million. One of the bids that was rejected was $9 million. Of course, the guy who was rejected with the $9 million thought they had a good proposal. They were unhappy that they didn't get evaluated on price, so they brought a lawsuit. The court agreed. The court essentially said, what kind of public process is going to result in two out of three bids being kicked out and only one left standing? And they didn't say it quite that way. That's my interpretation. What they said was, it's absurd that you could have somebody get 74 out of 100 points, be one point below the threshold, and you not entertain the price. So that you could then say, 74 points, $9 million. They might have said, 76 points, $11 million, 74 points, $9 million. That's a tough call. Now, it wasn't quite that black and white, but essentially the point is good commercial result versus process. The city of Kelowna designed a process. They followed the process. That's good, but the deeper consideration was, was the process designed real well? And I think that's what the court was essentially saying, that their process wasn't designed that well. You know, my learning or wisdom that I've gained over the years that, you know, the, the objective of procurement should be to keep as many bids in the game as long as possible so you can evaluate them on their merits. And too often I find there, it's almost a perverse delight taken in kicking bids out. Um, it's like once we kick them out, good, we don't have to think about them anymore. And, and it's like the game, a season of Survivor. At the end of the season, there's only one person left on the island. They're the winner. I don't think that might be good entertainment. I don't think it's good uh, public policy. So um, public procurement variables, in my experience, uh, every procurement can be, uh, the evaluation essentially comes down to those six items. And evaluate, your procurement is all about designing a process that figures out and articulates what you need in these six areas and how you're going to come to your evaluated judgment, how you're going to pick a winner. Um, or identify a, a, a bid that works for you. And, and this is an art of judgment, not science. And the more we try to make it science uh, and, and overlook the fact that there's still judgment there, that's where we get into trouble. So when your public organizations buy stuff, they typically use one of these four processes, uh, a tender, a request for proposals, a request for quotations, or sole source. There are others, there are more complicated, uh, but these are the core ways in which your organizations buy stuff. The challenge is these are terms of art. They don't have any commonly understood or unified meaning. We all think we know what we mean by them. Um, and we generally don't. So I've come up with my own um, classification system. And the way in which I'm going to describe them to you is trying to integrate the process with how you advertise it, with what body of rules you're going to follow. So in my classification system, a tender is a competitive process. You get the competition by advertising it on SAS tenders and the bodies of rules that you have to follow when you're running a tender are something called the law of competitive bidding and the trade agreements, and I'm gonna to talk to you about those in a minute. Um, ideally, the tender is best suited when you're having a competition on price and price alone, and the theory is all the other variables are fixed. You've got 
uh, a fixed scope of work because you know what you want. You've got a prescribed form of contract. You've defined your schedule. And the only thing left to figure out is price. And you replace negotiating the terms of price or the terms of the supply in exchange for competition on price. So that's a tender. A request for proposals, still a competitive process. Still a process that you post on SaaS tenders, that you're, you get the competition by advertising it publicly, posting it on SaaS tenders. You're still subject to one body of rules as a public body, the, the, the trade agreement rules, but you're not going to be subject to the law of competitive bidding, uh, and the consequences are, are a little less severe for breaking the rules. Um, now, there are more variables in play in a request for proposals. In a request for proposals, you're tending to have um, more variables in play, you have more flexibility, and you're leaving yourself room to negotiate. And if you're going to leave yourself room to negotiate, then by definition, you can negotiate pretty much anything, price, scope, schedule, um, contract terms. The uh, next system process for buying stuff that I've flagged is request for quotations. Um, now, how I differentiate RFQ from those two other processes, it still creates competition. So from a public sector perspective, you can still get competition. It's just you're not getting competition by posting on SAS tenders. You're getting it by inviting two, three, or four um, suppliers, vendors, to give you a proposal. It's less formal, less prescriptive, um, and what bodies of rules does it apply or, or apply to it? Neither the trade agreements nor the law of competitive bidding. So you have fewer um, process expectations and you can be more efficient when, when buying stuff using RFQ processes. From a public policy perspective, you're still getting competition. You're just getting it by invitation, not by public advertising. And you have maximum flexibility under this process. Um, the final procurement processes that your organizations use uh, is what's called sole, sole source. And, and as you can intuit from the label, there's no competition at all. You've just phoned up the local dealership and say, I need a new grader, um, you know, can I trade in my old grader? And you negotiate. Now, that doesn't have good public policy kind of considerations in terms of creating competition. There was no competition there. So you always have to question, am I meeting some of my public policy objectives when doing sole source? Um, and we will talk a little bit about those uh, further. Now. The source of the rules that we talk about for public procurement, and I'll, I'm just naming them here, I'll, I'll touch, touch them a little more fully in a minute. Um, the trade agreements, I'll explain those. The law of competitive bidding, I'll talk about. Uh, administrative law, I won't talk about very much. The point is that these are three different bodies of rules that can all apply to your procurement depending on how you structure it. Um, and so it's good to know which of the bodies of rules you're intending to apply to your procurement. The other thing that's interesting to note is these aren't three coherent bodies of rules, that they contradict one another in some instances, they're designed to achieve different objectives in other instances, and, and they're not, they don't all have the force of law. Some of them are good ideas, they're, you know, guidelines, they're expectations, and I've used the analogy, you know, I'm driving to Calgary after this uh, presentation with my kids to go on a ski trip, and if I get caught in a snowstorm, in, you know, I've learned that it's good to put my four-way flashers on in the snowstorm. That might be a good idea, it might be a good practice, but I'm not going to be sued or sued successfully um, for not having my four-way flashers on. So there are in the bodies of these rules, some of them are good suggestions. They're not necessarily legally enforceable. So I, I mentioned the trade agreements. So this is the first 
body of rules um, that, I, that we're going to talk about and, and just go down below the surface for a second in terms of depth. Um, there's two trade agreements. The agreement on internal trade, that's a trade agreement between the federal government and the 10 provinces. None of your municipalities ever signed it, but it's intended to apply to you. Uh, and then there's something called the New West Partnership Trade Agreement, uh, affectionately known as NUEPTA. It was signed in 2010, um, so about 20 years after the Agreement on Internal Trade. And NUEPTA is between the three western provinces, uh, Saskatchewan, Alberta, and BC. So two different trade agreements, two different blocks of public sector organizations that are, are subject to them. Your takeaway is... As municipal governments, you're subject to both of these bodies of rules. The slide that I'm trying to show you here is a summary of the key rules, and I'll describe a few of them where they're not necessarily a complete, coherent set of rules. They conflict with one another. The trade agreements are intended to reduce interprovincial trade barriers. And the way they're intended to do that is by those first two uh, items, those first two line items open access. When the trade agreements apply, you are expected to post your procurements on something called SAS tenders. That's your open access, that's advertising. Secondly, you're not supposed to have any local provincial preference. So again, when the trade agreements apply, you're not supposed to have a local preference. You're supposed to be equally happy with a supplier from Alberta, as you would be from Quebec, as you would be from Nova Scotia or BC. Now, when you're under the NUEPTA, you're only concerned about Alberta and BC suppliers, and when you're under the federal trade agreement, you got to care about the other eight provinces as well. But again, trade agreements are focused on interprovincial trade. That was the theory. And the way you meet your trade agreement obligations as a public body post on SAS tenders, no local preference. Now, sadly, you don't always get this right. Many of your procurement policies say explicitly, and I'll read from High River again, I'll pick on them because they're not here, preference is given to local firms. And I've read some of your procurement policies and you say that as well, and sadly, you're wrong. Um, you're, now, I appreciate the desire, and I'm not here to tell you the desire is wrong, I'm here to tell you you can't say it that explicitly. You need, you, you know, there are dollar thresholds in the trade agreements that I'll show you in a minute, and below the dollar thresholds, yes, you can have a local preference. And if you're a little more sophisticated, you can have indirect considerations of local content. I'm not sure that was the right term, but if you're running a construction project, local experience is relevant. If you're buying equipment and having it serviced in two hours or less, can be a local or can be a relevant evaluation point. So the challenge is, is to think about what's important, what's relevant, how to ask and talk about it, but don't call it a local preference unless it's below the, the dollar thresholds. The other several items on that list, fairness. Um, so you are required by the trade agreements to treat all bidders fairly. Sole source says you can't do it. The trade agreements say you cannot sole source unless, and then, and I'll, I'll show you later where the unlesses are. And you must articulate what your evaluation criteria are. You must articulate your method of evaluating, and you're supposed to disclose the method of weighting and this is where we digress from hard and fast rules into suggestions and expectations and policy guidelines. And it's these rules and expectations are observed in the breach uh, uh, fairly regularly. The, the difficulty with these trade agreement obligations, they're all found in trade agreements. They're to reduce trade barriers but why is it that Saskatchewan suppliers who lose the bid can use the trade agreements to bring protests against you? 
and I'll talk about that a little bit more uh, as we go on, but it, these are more than just trade issues, or these agreements create more than just trade expectations, they're really creating public procurement <coughs> process objectives, and you don't need to be from Alberta to use them to harass you or challenge you if you've got it wrong. So if, if you run a competitive process and you don't follow the evaluation process, the unsuccessful bidders that reside in Saskatchewan are just as able to use these uh, trade agreements to challenge you uh, as somebody from Alberta or Manitoba. Okay, dollar thresholds. Each of the trade agreements, AIT, Federal, NUEPTA, Western Canada, have different dollar thresholds. The difference being that below the thresholds, the trade agreements don't apply. That's code for you can have local preferences below the dollar threshold. Below the dollar thresholds, you don't have to post on SAS tenders. You can still advertise in your local paper. You can still encourage competition by phoning up the local supply community and say, I need gravel. Um, but above the dollar thresholds, you have these other expectations. Now, I said lack of coherence. You, you, I don't understand why the Western provinces have one set of dollar thresholds and the federal kind of trade agreement has a different. It just essentially drives us here in Saskatchewan to play by the lower dollar thresholds all the time. Then I also mentioned there are some exemptions um, from the trade agreements. So again, below the dollar threshold is an example of an exemption. Um, another example, the trade agreements have where there's only one supplier. If you've got you know, IBM computers in your municipality and you need them serviced or you have, like, of course you can go back to the IBM dealership to buy the repair service because they're the only ones licensed to do it. So there are examples where there's only one supplier who can legitimately meet the objective, um, and then that's an exemption to these trade agreements. Uh, in the case of an unforeseeable emergency, um, you don't need to abide by the trade agreement obligations. Again, remember, procurement is ultimately about balancing process with best value and efficiency, and by definition, in an emergency, uh, you got to cut some corners on the process side to keep uh, your hospital from flooding or to get the generator back up and running. So, you know, efficiency trumps process in that instance. Um, I, I put legal services up there as an example of another exemption. Um, a, because I'm a lawyer and I like the fact that you don't have to play by the uh, trade agreement rules to hire lawyers, but really I want to make a more subtle point. When you're hiring some consultants and professionals, they're trust-based relationships. They don't lend themselves to uh, running a process. Um, and sometimes there are confidentiality considerations. If you are uh, thinking of suing, let's say, the provincial government for not you know, abiding by some funding arrangement, you're not really gonna wanna advertise the fact that you're looking for a, hire, a lawyer to sue the provincial government with. Um, you might give them an advance warning. Um, and, and really, the, the probably the real reason that hiring certain consultants were left out of the trade agreements is because you, by definition, to be a professional, have to know and play by the local professional body, whether it's the law society, uh, APEGS, or the um, chartered accountant body. There's provincial rules and regulations that you have to be familiar with to be licensed. So it makes perfect sense that some professionals are outside the trade agreements. And the AIT got this right in my judgment. Engineers, architects, accountants, lawyers, and probably doctors, although you don't hire a lot of doctors, um, you don't have to abide by the trade agreements. But in the provincial, or in the NUEPTA, engineers and architects and accountants were left out. So if you're gonna hire architects, engineers, and accountants, and you're in Saskatchewan, Alberta, or BC, you're subject to the trade agreement if you're above the dollar threshold. That's a, an example of incoherence where these two bodies of rules 
made different policy choices, and I don't fully understand why. Um, my clients, when you if you've got a complicated hospital or a complicated um, recreation facility, and you've had the same engineers kind of working on that facility for the last 20 years, and you got a major renovation coming up for the chiller or the boiler, do you really want to go to the market and, and think of engineering services as a commodity? Well, under NUEPTA, that's the decision that's been made for you. So this is a slide that's just a screenshot of SAS tenders. This is what you're supposed to post your publicly advertised bids on and you're required to when they're above those dollar thresholds. You're free to below the dollar thresholds, but you don't have to. That's just what it looks like. This next slide isn't that exciting, so I'm gonna skip it. And uh, so the trade agreements, that is one body of rules. I'm now gonna to talk to you about the second body of rules, and it's called the law of competitive bidding. Those trade agreements only apply to public sector bodies, the feds, the province, municipal governments, school boards, health regions. This body of law applies not only to public sector bodies, but also the private sector. So it applies to Mosaic, Potash Corp, Cameco, Brandt, applies to everybody if you're running a true tender. So this body of rules basically tries to say that if you're running a true competitive tender and you expect bidders to hold their bids to be open and irrevocable for 60 days, and if you've asked bidders to submit a bid bond or bid security on the theory that if they get awarded the bid and then they won't enter into the contract, you can cash their bid bond and keep it. This is the body of law that tries to make sense of all that. And, and what happened one time in 1981, a contractor won a bid and had submitted a bid bond and then realized they'd made a mistake and it was going to be better for them not to let the to lose the bid bond than to enter into the contract. They were going to lose too much money on the contract because of the price mistake they made. And the courts, this went all the way to the Supreme Court in 1981, it's the case known as Ron Engineering. The court said, darn it, we think that's wrong. We don't think they should just forfeit the bid bond. We think they should also have to enter into the contract. And if they don't enter into the contract, we want the public sector body or anybody to be able to sue them for the, for the cost that it should have cost. So maybe a better example is, I don't remember the numbers, I, maybe I never knew the numbers, but if the winning bid was to build something for $10 million and then they refuse to enter into the contract and the next lowest bid is $12 million, the law of competitive bidding says if you don't enter into the contract and we take the second bid, the first guy can be sued for two million bucks. So that's the law of competitive bidding from the perspective of the bidder who doesn't enter into the bid into the uh, the construction contract. You can get sued and sued successfully for that. $2 million that I just described. So how did the court do this? They did it by creating a fiction called the bid contract. And in a construction tender, and in the law of competitive bidding, there's two contracts. There's the bid contract that's governing the selection process, and then there's the performance contract that gets awarded to one bidder. So if you've got five bidders competing for the contract, you've got five bid contracts. Everybody in the competitive process is playing by the rules of the bid contract. And then there's only one performance contract at the end of that. So as I said, the obligations on the bidders are to enter into that performance contract and live by your bid and not try to revoke your bid. Pretty simple, pretty precise. But contracts are always about rights and obligations going both ways. 
So if that's the expectation on the bidders, then what are the expectations on the owners, the public sector bodies running the bids? And here's what they are. They're to treat all bidders fairly and equally, to evaluate all the bids using one common set of criteria, not to have any undisclosed preferences, not to allow bids to be altered after the bid date for receiving bids, and, and on and on. The point here is, A, the list is longer, and the list is more subjective, it's more nebulous, it's, um, it's harder to say with precision what the obligations are. Um, fairness and equally, well, it's a bit like beauty, it's in the eye of the beholder. So I'll just go back to the story I introduced at the outset. We had set up deliberately a law of competitive bidding process where we wanted the bids to be irrevocable, and when we picked a winning bid, we, we wanted the bidder to be obligated. So the corollary, on the other hand, then we had to abide by all these rules. And the, you know, the rule that says you can't allow bids to be altered forced our hand. When bids come in, that's it. You can't accept an amendment to that bid under the law of competitive bidding after the bid date. So because we had established a law of competitive bidding process, we had to abide by the rule, and it didn't matter how attractive that bid adjustment was, even though that bidder made a mistake, even though that bidder intended to bid hundreds of thousands of dollars less, we couldn't allow them to alter their bid. And had we wanted to, then guess what? We could have been sued by the other unsuccessful bidders for breaching the bid contract. Our obligations under the bid contract are not to do certain things, and if we do one of the wrong things, we can be sued for not acting fairly, not treating the bidders um, equally, and we can get sued for the lost profits of the bidder who should have won. So effectively in the law of competitive bidding, the courts have made this absolute rule. It's not written down in your bid invitations, but it's found in the case law. You cannot accept a non-compliant bid and then there are hundreds and hundreds of cases out there that are helping to define when is a bid non-compliant and trying to amend your bid price after the bid closing date would be a black and white non-compliance. Now, this is, these are the rules in the law of competitive bidding. These, and the consequences in the law of competitive bidding are you can get, as a public body, you can get sued for lost profits, and, and that should be a big red flag um, because that's a bad consequence. Now, the good news is that the law of competitive bidding is always a choice. When you design your procurements, the first decision point you should make, maybe the second, but the second should be, do I want to create a process subject to the law of competitive bidding or not? And the way you analyze that is to say, do I really need the bids to be irrevocable? Do I really need a bid bond and bid security? And in my experience, often you don't. And as you look at your process, what you're trying to buy, if irrevocable bids and, and bid security, and if all of that is not that important, then don't choose the law of competitive bidding, because the consequences of being out offside the law of competitive bidding are too severe. There are several other elements to the uh, body, or there are other laws applicable. There's administrative law. Um, administrative law applies to all decisions that your public municipal governments make. If you're handing out taxi licenses or building permits. The admin law says you have to make those decisions fairly. You can't be arbitrary. You can't make those decisions in bad faith. You know, if you, if you comply with all of the planning and development requirements, 
you got to issue the building permit. You can't be arbitrary and say, well, we just don't want you to be able to build that development in this neighborhood because we don't like you. I mean, that's not a good public decision-making process. So admin law is designed to apply to all your decisions. It just happens to apply to your procurement decisions as well. So, so far, I've told you there's three bodies of rules that apply to procurement decisions. The trade agreements, the law of competitive bidding, which is contract-based, and then finally, admin law. Uh, and, and they evolve from different sources, they have different purposes, but they all apply. And, and again, it's confusing, yes, that's why there's a book like that to, to help straighten it out, but it, it's even more confusing sometimes. But maybe the best analogy, it's like um, drinking and driving. Uh, we all know it's bad, um, but if, if you are in an accident and if there's a fatality, it's only, it's, it's drinking and driving, it's one activity, but there are different consequences, there are different rules that apply. One set of rules is the highway traffic <laughs> rules, you're gonna lose your driver's license, but that's a provincial offense. You're also gonna be charged under the criminal code if there was a fatality for drinking and driving, and it's a criminal offense, and it, that's a whole different body of rules, but more severe consequences. Well, the rules that apply to procurement, are, are they all apply to the same activity, but they're different rules with different consequences. And again, as a general guideline, the law of competitive bidding has the more one of the more onerous consequences that you might want to avoid where possible. So I'm, I'm going to turn and, and talk a little bit about the consequences of breaking the rules. And the consequences, which I was alluding to, depend on which rules you're breaking. And let me start with the trade agreements, and then I'll turn to the law of competitive bidding. But the trade agreements are a funny couple of documents. That agreement on internal trade has no effective set of consequences for breaking it for your organizations. It's been around since 1990. No municipal government and no provincial government has been sued under the trade agreements for a remedy under the trade agreements. There just isn't an effective remedy under that document. Now, if you're the federal government, it's a different story. The federal government set up something called the Canadian International Trade Tribunal and said, if I, the federal government, break my trade agreement obligations under AIT, you can sue me, you can sue me for uh, lost profits, I'm good, bring it on. And it was like they painted a big target on themselves and guess what? unsuccessful bidders have obliged them, and they regularly sue the federal government for not following the procurement process that they said they would, and they get sued and sued successfully regularly, and they get lost profits awarded against them. Now, again, the agreement on internal trade, we're not just talking about American and Mexican um, suppliers suing the federal government, we're talking about domestic um, suppliers and vendors from based in Canada suing the federal government. In the last two years, I had one of my associates do a survey. There's been 48 cases against the federal government, you know, that have run through the process and resulted in a decision based on procurement matters from domestic um, organizations. So the federal government has created a very effective incentive and a very effective remedy for unsuccessful bidders to fire arrows at them. The AIT never had such an effective tool against municipal governments, and hence you've never been harassed by um, this trade agreement. Now, NUEPTA started out in 2010, similar to AIT, there was no effective remedy against um, municipal sector governments. However, in 2015, July 1st of this year, or last year, it was amended. And so we have now built in to NUEPTA what's called a bid protest mechanism. 
So again, this is just applicable to in the provinces of Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, sorry, BC. You have to be a supplier based in those three provinces to use this bid protest mechanism against one of these three governments. But your governments, your municipal governments are now have a smaller target painted on your chest. You aren't going to be sued for lost profits, but you can be, and I'll use the term sued, I'll explain it in a minute, for up to $50,000 for bid development costs by unsuccessful bidders and up to $50,000 worth of arbitration costs. So per claim, $100,000 max, kind of rolls off the tongue, nice round number. Not sure how many of you have a budget, a line item in your budget to pay out a couple of these every year, but uh, you know it will be could become a risk. Now, the theory of the provincial governments was, well, we need this discipline on municipal sector bodies so that they'll do a better job. So rather than giving you grants to hire more purchasing agents and get more um, you know, training and, and help develop better tools, they, they gave a stick to the hands of the unsuccessful bidders to discipline uh, you for them. And so they've, in designing the process, their goal was to make it fast and efficient. So the way they've designed a fast and efficient system to fire arrows at you is, first of all, an unsuccessful bidder can bring a complaint against you, it's called a bid protest, and you've got 20 days from the day they bring the complaint against you, you've got 20 days to, quote, make every reasonable effort to resolve the complaint. Not sure what that means. Nobody knows what that means. Absolutely, if you can talk them out of being unhappy um, and tell them, don't worry, be happy next time, maybe you'll win, that might work. Maybe you'll write a check. And, and you'll just say, well, just tell me how much you spent on, on developing your bid costs. You lost, sorry, uh, yeah, I didn't follow my rules. Here's a check for $5,000. They might go away happy. But if you can't get them to go away happy in the 20 days, then they get to send refer their dispute to arbitration. And each province is supposed to appoint five arbitrators and unhappy bidders where the consultation process doesn't work can then refer the matter to arbitration, and it's supposed to be an expedited arbitration. It's just based on written submission, so you have 14 days to write a, your story about what happened and what didn't happen, and you make your written submission to the arbitrator. The unhappy bidder has 14 days, and the arbitrator gets these two written submissions and gets to make a decision based on the two submissions. Um, and guess what? They can make an award that can include awarding up to $100,000 against your municipality. So I personally am not sure that that is a desirable policy objective from your point of view, but this is the new tool in the toolkit of unhappy bidders. Hasn't been used to my knowledge yet, but I think the key word is yet. It's hard to imagine that it won't come into play in the future. The other thing that this bid protest mechanism can be used is to apply to postpone your procurement. So if you've designed a procurement that somebody thinks is biased against their solution, they can write to you while your procurement is going on and say, I think your process is biased. So let's say you're specking graders and you've specced essentially a John Deere. What do you think the Volvo manufacturer and the Volvo supplier is going to do. They're going to say, well, wait a minute, I can't win. This is specced out for a John Deere. They're going to send a complaint to you, and that may have the result of stopping your procurement process. Um, and so it's a tool in the hands of bidders um, to challenge you uh, and, and provide some discipline on your procurement processes. So the other types of um, remedies or consequences, lawsuits. So if you're in that law of competitive bidding that I referred to, if you, if you create a process that's subject to the law of competitive bidding, you can get sued for lost profits. Um, pretty dangerous, be careful using the law of tender. Under administrative law, you, lawsuits can get started, but they're not to get compensation for the unsuccessful bidder, 
is to basically reverse the decision. Basically what the court might say under an administrative law principle is, you've come, they don't care whether you make a good decision or a bad decision. What they care about under admin law principles is that you followed a good process and that you got to a fair result that wasn't influenced by bad faith or arbitrary decisions. And if you remember that Kelowna example that I gave at the outset, what the court really said was, your process was fundamentally flawed to set it up where if you had 74 points, you don't get your price evaluated. And if you have 76 points, you do get your price evaluated. The court just thought that was an unreasonable process. That's not that uncommon a process, by the way. Um, and maybe that court will get, uh, that decision will get appealed. But that's an example of the court saying, I don't think that your process was reasonable. And that's what admin law is all about, is the reasonableness of the process. Um, freedom of information legislation is a tool that unsuccessful bidders can use to ask you to give them their evaluation results. Every unsuccessful bidder feels aggrieved. Every unsuccessful bidder would like a remedy, and they can use freedom of information legislation as a process to start gathering the information. And what they'll do is they'll ask you for their evaluation results, and under freedom of information legislation, you're required to give it. Next, they'll ask you for the other guy's evaluation results, because they think that you have not only evaluated them poorly, that you've evaluated them more favorably than they deserved. The principles under freedom of information legislation entitle them to get their own evaluation results, but generally not the other person's, because generally that contains confidential information. Um, but the point is, this too has cost you time and money. Um, we had a client uh, municipal uh, government this summer, ran a competition. Uh, there was only two horses in the race, and the you know, the horse that didn't win used the FOI process to A, get their own information, and B, they tried to get the other information. And when we said, no, you're not entitled to it, they said, well, we don't agree with you. And they made an application to the privacy commissioner. And again, that costs the municipal government time and resources, internal time, um, money on people like their external lawyers. So um, there are remedies, consequences for against public sector bodies for not running good procurement processes. What can you do to avoid them? Um, well, typically procurement disputes arise because of the evaluation. It's uh, almost without fail. The problem is in the evaluation. Uh, so that's where you need to invest your time and effort. I'll, I'll say a little bit about that in a second. Um, another area where you get into lots of trouble is conflicts of interest. I'll, I'll make a couple of comments uh, on that as well. So the common evaluation complaints are you didn't disclose all the evaluation criteria. Uh, you ended up evaluating based on criteria that weren't disclosed. You didn't follow the evaluation process you set out in your, um, in your materials. You, you had an undisclosed preference for John Deere versus Volvo um, and on. So those are the kinds of complaints. Here's the problem that I see happening in your procurements is that the conventional wisdom seems to be that you need to fully define in your, value, in your procurement documents how you're going to select a winner and that you should do that in part by having fully weighted evaluation criteria and, and you put all those that into uh, your procurement documents. And, and so there's this trend towards increasing complexity. 
And complexity has its place where the dollars and risks are high enough and you've got the kind of resources to make sense of the complexity. But what happens is SASC builds, puts out their P3 procurement documents to do a bypass. And it's, it's at the high end of the game in terms of complexity. But your organization start to cherry pick, well, that looks like a good idea. And you start sticking that into your documents and your documents are getting more unintentionally complicated and harder and harder to apply. And it's that complexity that gets you into trouble. And, and the way to avoid the kind of evaluation challenges is to actually figure out how to run an evaluation that's on the other side of complex, that's actually simpler, not more complex. You know, if the idea is that you're supposed to be able to fully define how you're going to select your winner, it assumes that at the outset you really do know what's important and how you're going to pick your winner. And, you know, in my experience, lots of organizations need the evaluation process to get smarter by talking to different teams to figure out what's really important. So, you know, this should happen in IT procurements all the time, or if you're hiring construction managers or other consultants, um, it's the process of talking to them that you start to learn. And, and, and a lot of your organizations are smaller, haven't necessarily done some of the procurements before, and you need the process to, to help you get smarter. Um, and, and so if you adopt the philosophy that I can predict how I'm going to pick my winner at the outset, and you try to define that in, in your procurement document, then you're not giving yourselves the flexibility to learn something through the procurement and be smarter at the other end of it. And that's when you tend to get into trouble. Um, one of the examples that I see repeatedly in, in procurements of, is we're going to have points and we're going to award points up to 100. Um, and, oh, yeah, we're going to do an interview and a reference check. And out of the 100 points, the interview and the reference checks might be worth 10 or 20 points. So it sounds interesting and appealing. But when you ground truth that or stress test that against how you hire people, you realize that doesn't make any sense. Um, if you get a bunch of resumes in to hire a new chief administrative officer, and you've got a really appealing resume, and then you do the interview, and if the person flops in the interview, you don't just give the person a few points on the interview, but because the resume was so good, you still evaluate them high. Or if you do a reference check, and they say this person is very high maintenance, you do not want to employ this person. If you gave that person 10 points on the reference, and you gave them one or two points out of 10 on the reference, but they had a great looking resume because they hired a really good writer, they could still win. That doesn't make any sense at all. You know that when you're hiring people. But when we're designing procurements, we do that all the time. And it doesn't make any sense. That's where you get into trouble. And that's why you get challenged is because um, you think you know what's important and you, you saw it in some other procurement example and then you just try to repeat it, and it, if it doesn't make sense, um, it gets you into trouble. You know, one other little story, um, I worked with K plus S, building a potash mine. They thought they knew what was important at the outset, and we worked very hard to design a process that would maximize certainty of risk and the schedule, and we really wanted to incentivize the contractor to get this equipment supplied to us with this minimum amount of risk back to us by this schedule, and we had all the incentives lined up. That's what was important. That's how we designed the process. Problem was, when we got the price back, we decided we really couldn't afford it. And so we got smarter through the process. We thought schedule and we thought risk allocation was the most important. But when the market told us how expensive that was going to be, we changed our minds. Well, when you're in the public sector and you've fully identified your evaluation criteria and you've fully allocated points, 
to what you think is important, you don't allow the process to educate you, and then you're stuck following the process you set, said you would. I said I would um, talk for just a second about conflicts of interest. Um, there's two types of conflicts. Conflicts to be avoided and conflicts to be managed, and there is a difference. Conflicts to be avoided are where a bidder has an unfair advantage that can't be solved. The bidder has inside information, maybe they were in a former employee, or uh, the vendor hired a former employee and they know all about your purchasing kind of planning around this particular procurement, or maybe they've been lobbying um, some decision makers. Those are conflicts to be avoided. Conflicts to be managed is where there's a relationship between the vendor and somebody in your organization, either somebody on council, somebody in administration, or somebody who's part of the evaluation making team. Now, the reason I say that's a, a conflict to be managed is you don't disqualify people for having these relationship conflicts. You manage it by saying, let's isolate the decision maker from that evaluation process so that it's not tainted. And um, a lot of times I see procurement documents where if you disclose a relationship conflict, the rules say, well, we may reject you, we may disqualify you. And, you know, it's not the vendor's fault it's a small community and they happen to be related to somebody um, or they happen to have these other relationships. It's just the nature of small communities. So the better strategy is how do you then isolate the decision makers so that people who might be influenced by that relationship aren't participating? That's kind of the better way to manage uh, uh, those kinds of conflicts. So how to avoid getting sued and getting sued successfully, how to avoid these bid protests, how to avoid admin law issues? Well, the answer is have good tools, have follow best practices, and, you know, th this is, these next two slides are just a quick summary of what those tools would be. Good policies. I've read some of your policies. Lots of them still talk about must post on Mercs. That's now out of date. They must post on SAS tenders. Um, lots of them talk about... Um, the wrong dollar thresholds. You're still referring to the AIT dollar thresholds, not the lower NUEPTA thresholds. Some of you have, you know, a local preference in your policies. That's wrong unless it's below the dollar threshold. So have good policies, um, have good procurement tools, good tools that can be efficiently used, and some good how-to guides. train your staff, you know, this is all common sense. The challenge is to do, to follow these best practices um, and to invest in these good tools costs time and resources, time and money, and you have to be motivated to want to do it. So it's the what to do is not that hard. Just come talk to me. I can explain it to you. But the harder decision is why to do it. Now, the pretext of this whole presentation was how to avoid lawsuits. So clearly one reason to do it is to avoid lawsuits and claims. That's okay. They, frankly, they aren't all that frequent, um, especially in the smaller jurisdictions, so that might not be quite enough um, reason to do it. I think a second reason to do it, though, is to avoid eliminating attractive bids. So if you go back to the City of Kelowna example, eliminating two out of three bids didn't end up in a good public policy decision. Um, they left money on the table, uh, and that wasn't necessarily a good result. So bad processes, bad tools might end up with the result of leaving attractive bids uh, on the table that you can't evaluate. Because there is a golden rule. Whatever process you create, you better follow it. That's where you get into the trouble. So um, if, if you create a process and, it's, and it ends up inadvertently knocking out two out of three bids, that was a bad process, 
but you better follow it. So that's why to make the investment uh, in the process in the first place is so that you don't end up with that result. I suppose the other third reason I would leave you with um, about why to make the investment is back to that fundamental reason or one of those principal objectives of pro procurement, efficiency, effectiveness. Um, you've got limited people generally in your organizations. Um, they're often pressed for time. The better their tools, the simpler the tools, the easier it is for them to help get stuff done. Um, so rather than investing in more people and more resources, figure out how to improve your procurement tool so you can do more with less. Um, so I'm just, yeah, I think uh, I'm open to questions. Uh, at this point, I've, uh, I think we're scheduled to go to right till 4.15, but I was encouraged by Marosika to give more time, not less. Uh, so I am happy to take questions on anything I've kind of uh, confused you about in my remarks or something that I left hanging and didn't address. Peter Gresswell, Maple Creek. Um, we typically on large projects hire the services of an engineering firm to uh, prepare the tender and uh, help us to um, follow that process through. Sh and although we ratify their decision, I believe that we take their their uh, advice that we pay dearly for quite quite stringently. And I just wonder what our liability is in that kind of relationship. Well, if the engineer gives you bad advice and you follow the advice and it ends up breaching the bid contract or being offside the trade agreement, unsuccessful bidders don't care who made the decision. If they have a complaint, it's against you and they'll bring the complaint against you and they'll have their remedy against you. You may look over your shoulder to your architects or engineering friends and ask for their support. They will work very hard to avoid um, you know, being financially responsible and they'll try to leave you hanging uh, on your own. Um, so they're your agents, you're responsible legally for their bad advice. That leaves small municipalities in a terrible situation. Um, You, it's hard to answer this without being too self-serving. Um, okay, I'll own my bias. Um, you know, contact your, get legal advice. And, and maybe, maybe the best way to demonstrate that, remember that story I told you at the outset? The bids came in on Thursday. The bid price adjustment came in on Friday. You can read my lips in terms of what was the advice of the architects and the project managers where it was, that's okay, you can take that. They thought so, because it was, you know, they were all motivated to want to give that answer. Um, we just came to a view that that wasn't a, the right answer. Um, and so it's, I see advice, like running procurement processes is, a subspecialty, and the professional consultants, architects, and engineers know a lot about it, but there's still stuff that they don't know. And if they get it wrong, it's okay. They have liability insurance. I'd ask them the question, does their liability insurance cover bad procurement advice? Your lawyer's liability insurance does. Um, so that's the self-serving answer. My apologies. But thank you for the question. No, no. Uh, Erhard Fogelmiller from the town of Crawford. The question I have is in regards to uh, the preferential treatment. In small towns, we have very few suppliers. They pay a lot of taxes to the town. They also, as business people and as individuals and families, contribute lots as far as volunteers go.
And so when you have a smaller item, and I'm not talking about the $75,000, I'm talking less than that. We have set a policy, and you can tell me if it's wrong or not, and that's what I want to know, where there's a 10% tolerance. We will give a bid, on a bid, on a bid, bid system, let's use a mower or something like that for an example, 10% variance, and we'll go in favor of the local individual. Now, how can we work that if that's wrong? How can we work that so we can still do that? Because we have communities around us that would underbid our guys only to come there and do that and walk away and never see them again. And, and you got the services and all that stuff that has to be done to that particular piece of equipment afterwards. You run out of town to get that service done because the local guy isn't going to do it. He said, you didn't buy it from me. I'm not looking after it. So, uh, good question. Um, so, if you're talking about buying lawnmowers, I think what you're describing is as long as the price from the local supplier is 10% or is, is no more than 10% more than from the from Saskatoon supplier, you're going to buy the local. That's essential. That's right, yeah. um, so, is it right or wrong? It, there's nothing wrong with it as long as it's below those dollar thresholds. So if you want, as a municipality, to have that clearly articulated and that precise a policy, it's okay under the trade agreements, um, as long as it's below the dollar threshold. Now, there are other ways in which you can still, like 10% is an artificial number, um, you can bring into your consideration um, serviceability, the ability to service um, uh, as well into your decision making. But if you want to keep it simple and you want a black and white rule, a, a number works. Um, what if it's 11%? Well, we, I just picked that number. I know, but as soon as you set a rule, you're setting the, you, you know, you're setting, well, what are you going to do at 11%? So, so you can have local preferences and you don't have to have um, a precise number, and the difficulty is what you're doing is then you're setting up somebody has to exercise judgment, and the question is on this lawnmower, on this day, are you prepared to spend 11% more to get it locally versus from Saskatoon? Sorry to pick on Saskatoon, I grew up there. Um, and that's a judgment, and judgment is okay, people just aren't comfortable with it, and so you'd rather just set the 10% rule. But both could work as long as you're below the dollar thresholds. Okay, thank you. Anything else, folks? Are there any other questions? We, um, uh, John, will be happy to answer them if there are some questions that we need to have documented and record that would certainly be uh, beneficial to everybody. I, I'm sorry, a little, little closer to the mic. Sorry. Sorry. Lorna Beaton from the town of Bruno. Is there any chance of getting some of this on a slide or sent to us if we put an email to you? I'm not a legal person. This is a lot of legal stuff in here. Um, I kind of use common sense when I do purchasing with the, with the council, but I wasn't aware of the 75,000 trade agreement items. Is there like a, a checklist or a simple document that people can follow and create their policies from? I think Beverly's standing right next to you, and she wants to desperately answer that. Well, the answer is right now this session that we're in is being recorded, so if you want to reflect back on that, that'll be posted on the senior website, as well as the trade agreements that were referenced today. They're also on the internet that you can look at those as well. And I can give you my business card afterwards, feel free to call me and I'll assist you in any way. I, I might also add that there, again, it's called the NUEPTA Secretariat, NUEPTA, New West Partnership Trade Agreement, but they have a website, and on their website they have some guidelines, and, and it's more complicated 
because they're trying to tell you everything. And, and so sometimes when we try to tell you everything, we don't end up telling you anything. Um, and, and so that's the trouble with those guidelines. There's good information there. They're pretty useful. So that's a place to start. And I'm, I'm happy to take other questions. Yes, sir. Trevor Lowy, Town of Kelvington. I'm just wondering, is your PowerPoint going to be available on the SUMO website? Yes. I... Matt Ross, the Town of Potter View. You put out a RFP, I think it was. I can't see. Can you see those the binding or RFP? Um, so, so I think the question is, is are RFPs safer and, and are they not legally binding? Is that a fair summary? Okay, so it's a good question and in my taxonomy system and in my classification system, RFPs are safer, but because when I use an RFP, it's always to signal the choice outside the law of competitive bidding. So any RFP that I write never says this bid will be, bids will be irrevocable for 60 days. It never says, you know, the winning bidder must enter into the contract. In my RFPs, I always say, you can amend your bid anytime you want. You can withdraw your bid anytime you want. And I do that because I don't want to impose any obligations on bidders under the law of contract because I don't want any on my client. So it's safer in the sense that it's outside the law of competitive bidding. It's still subject to those other bodies of rules, trade agreements, and administrative law, but the consequences are generally much less. So d just to elaborate on that, Anytime you see the word RFP, doesn't mean it's not subject to the law of competitive bidding. I would be prepared to put a $5 wager on if you go get your hands on any RFP that I didn't produce. Um, it probably has those hallmarks in it, which means it's, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. So RFPs can be tender, subject to the law of competitive bidding because of the things inside of it. Um, and if you want to be, if you want to be inside the law of competitive bidding, and you want to run an RFP, that's okay. Just know that you're doing it. <laughs>